Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part four of my European trip. A few more things that I want to share with you before I get back to my regular programming and some, obviously, some hardcore science. Because it was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, the museum had a large exhibit of Apollo memorabilia. And for this weekend, they brought in somebody who had created a particularly important piece on the moon. You probably don't know who this guy is. His name is Paul van Hoydonk, and he's actually a Belgian artist. He was a sculptor, and he created a piece of art which was flown to the moon and is still there to this day. It was carried to the moon on board Apollo 15, and its presence was kept secret until the post-mission press conference. Here's Dave Scott. I think many people have contributed to this pinnacle we've reached. Some have contributed more than others, and we know of 14 individuals who contributed all they had. And because of that, while we left a, a small memorial on the moon, about 20 feet north of Rover 1, in a small, subtle crater, there's a simple plaque with 14 names. And those are the names in alphabetical order of all the astronauts and cosmonauts who have died in the pursuit of exploration of space. Near it is a small figure representing a fallen astronaut. We went to the moon as trained observers in order to gather data, uh, not only with our instruments on board, but with our minds. And I'd like to quote a statement from Plutarch, which I think expresses our feelings uh, since we've come back. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. Thank you. So the story goes that Dave Scott had met the artist at a cocktail party, and the plan had more or less been hatched. It did require approval from Nixon, who supposedly asked whether the Paul was a Republican, to which they responded, no, he's a Belgian. The design had to be small, robust against the lunar environment and it had to be intentionally abstract because they wanted to not have this show any signs of gender or ethnic differences because of course this was to commemorate cosmonauts and astronauts. Indeed three cosmonauts had died just months before the launch of Apollo 15. The plaque was put together by Dave Scott, who selected the 14 names that he knew. There were a few he however missed. In 2013, he actually wrote a book with Alexei Leonov, and sadly, Alexei Leonov has passed away this week. But uh, yeah, this book was The Two Sides of the Moon, and in it he reveals that there were two Soviet cosmonauts who had died during the uh, Soviet program. There was also a third astronaut, a US astronaut, Robert Henry Lawrence Jr., who was selected by the US Air Force for the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program, but again died during training. He would have been the America's first black astronaut if it wasn't for this unfortunate uh, accident. It's an unfortunate but understandable omission, and frankly, all the more reason to put an updated version of it together when we finally set foot on the moon again. There are space artifacts basically all over the place, hanging off the walls and display cases, models of missions, but one of the cool things I saw was actual solar panels from the Hubble Space Telescope. These flew on the Hubble and they were you know, taken off and replaced during one of the servicing missions. And the coolest part is when you zoom in, you can actually see tiny craters where little particles have made holes in these. And of course, since the hardware is being designed here, there's lots of mock-ups and stuff from missions which perhaps have uh, flown or some are still in development. And, you know, of course, the 3D printing has made a lot of the development, you know, able to get tactile models faster. Some of the older models are a little more lo-fi. But kind of the nerve center for developing new hardware is something called the Concurrent Design Facility. And it is a big part of what Aztec does. It is essentially a big room where everybody gets together with their different skills, the thermal engineers, the electronics, the communications, the structure people, 
And everybody has is a, like a big LAN party where they design the spacecraft and solve the problems that they're very good at and offer compromises. In the middle of the room, the customer will be the person that actually has to make the call to, do, to explore one mechanism or another. And the whole point is to have everybody in the same place at the same time. So that it's not a case of making agreements over email where there's, uh, you know, where all the contingencies may not be properly understood. It puts everybody together and makes things happen faster. And it's not just, they don't just use this for space. This is used for, by uh, private companies that will rent this out to solve their problems. Obviously, when I was there for the open day, it wasn't in active use, but I did spend a lot of time in there because you know, the people that were helping me out and escorting me around and showing me all the cool stuff, this was their day job, was supporting this kind of thing and providing technical expertise on spacecraft design. This is Xavier. He actually held the camera during a lot of those interviews. I'm very grateful to him and all the support he gave. Unfortunately, this particular section kept on having lousy audio because of uh, cell phone interference. But uh, yeah, he gave us a really good overview of the, the system here, using his workmanlike art to describe basic mission requirements. No. I've heard that sometimes there's a lot of things that have come through here. We've got this thing on the wall. and. Uh, I've heard that it's not uncommon for concepts to come through here and not come out the other side as a working product, like to get rejected until later, right? Well, the point of doing a feasibility analysis is to say whether yes or no it will, it is possible or not. But what happens usually here is you have the customer in the front row and the customer will say uh, when... That's we, these seats, right? We, yeah, exactly. So it, it's surrounded by the engineers. And he will say, OK, I want this. And then you have the guidance engineer that say, well, uh, what you're asking is like five order magnitude to too much for what we are capable of. Because uh, maybe he has worked on a, on a mission. Uh, for example, we had a, a mission that was very similar to Lisa Pathfinder. And we had the, the, the guy who designed the GNC for, for that mission in this room. And he was say, OK, we achieved that. Uh, so that's, that's what's possible. And then also we have the cost engineer that say, oh, but what you're asking, uh, so you want uh, this uh, piece of equipment from that mission, but it has costed um, so, on, so and so millions, so that would be like half of your budget. And then the customer says, okay, uh, maybe they can change the requirement. So yeah. it's not so much, uh, there's a fixed concept before and we say yes or no, but there's a concept before and there's, it gets matured and consolidate it into a, a mission architecture. And Finally, I had a lot of fun talking with the amateur rocketry teams here. This is EPFL, their Swiss team, and they uh, have gone to the Space for America Cup. Their hardware includes air brakes because the, apparently the competition, I hadn't realized this, they have to hit as close to the target altitude as possible. So their uh, control system is going to slow it down using air brakes to try and hit the exact altitude. They actually gave me like a PCB and I'd love to know what to do with it because of course I'm totally inept when it comes to electronics. The other team is the Stratos team and these guys have been actually trying to get uh, me to come over for a very, very long time. These, they have been going for really high altitudes. Right now they're working on Stratos 4 and it is, it is a very ambitious program. Run out of the University of Delft, the Stratos 4 is supposed to cross the Kármán line at 100 kilometers. This uses a hybrid propulsion system using a nitrous oxide oxidizer and the fuel mixture is paraffin, sorbitol and aluminium. And they kind of approached me right at the end of the day and said we'd love you to come over. I looked at my schedule and I found that my flight wasn't leaving until 2 o'clock the next day. So I came up with this agreement. They would pick me up, take me to show off their rocket. I was super excited, got some early bed, got my bags packed. And 10 minutes before they were to pick me up, I was notified that my flight was cancelled and I needed to get back. And the only flight they would give me was, you know, basically two hours hence. So 
So these amazing guys, instead of taking me to show their awesome rocket, they just became taxi drivers and took me to the airport. But it was the best taxi conversation ever because I got to talk all about the details of their student project, all the stuff that's going on. And I wish them the best of luck and I hope that I get a chance to visit them at some point in the future. Even then, the flight was kind of disastrous in the worst possible way because we connected through Houston on the way back and I was in Houston for three hours. I didn't have time to go and see any cool stuff that is in Houston. I found this beer, which was space shuttle themed. Endeavor, I was so excited. I want to try this beer. Guess what? It doesn't exist anymore. The brewery stopped making it. I was sufficiently curious that I asked if I could have the the one on display And the bartender informed me that wasn't possible because it was glued down. Okay, I'll admit there are worse things that could happen when flying is involved. I just thought that one was particularly funny. But yeah, it has been an amazing weekend and I hope you found some interest in the videos I've posted. I'm going to get back to regular production soon. Until then, thanks to everyone that helped me out in Europe and thanks to the amazing people I met. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.